And uh, that also taught us a lesson, you know. And I keep uh, telling people that unless you are a banker, don't go into banking. <laughs> unless you are a banker. You know, and it can, uh, especially, you know, uh, somebody who is an entrepreneur with a very big business, it will be, it will be almost uh, suicidal if you try to go into banking. You know, I will tell you one within that. Even if I get money, I will tell you the story of why somebody shouldn't be in banking, you know, if you are a big conglomerate. Banking for a big conglomerate is really, really very, very bad. And uh, it can bring the whole group down. So you have to be very, very careful. In the future, when you get there, if you see banking and you are an entrepreneur with a lot of business interest, then you get there, just... Uh, Take off <laughs> So, you know, with this, uh, you know, we, we incorporated uh, DIL, we transformed, uh, you know, this, and we decided that, okay, part of what became, uh, I don't know, at that time was to say, okay, but how do we actually utilize this cash that we had, you know, uh, what do we do? And I think we called uh, the chairman, I think he was the CEO of Nigerian breweries. Then, um, not festers, um, I think uh, the wedding. He came and he told us that look, the opportunities are a lot in Nigeria, you have uh, not even scratched the surface, blah blah. You know, so we listened to him and uh, we called another guy, I, I don't really remember, I think was the chairman at that time, uh, Guinness, of course, LIB at that time was MD. So rest in peace. He also came and we were really very, very scared at that time of industry. Because we tried uh, textile at that time. We went into textile in 1989 to have there And we really suffered mainly because of the massive, at, that, at the beginning it was Indian, uh, you know, uh, attack. It was just coming from India that made us to, uh, you know, lose so much money. Then the Chinese also joined. And uh, it was totally killed the industry. If you remember, the textile industry used to be the second employer of labor in Nigeria. The total people working in the textile industry was, I think, over 260,000 people, which is almost now, really. Uh, our own at that time, I think we had in uh, Lagos around 4,700 plus, and in Kano 1,800, then we had the generis. But total, we had almost about uh, 6,400 something people, you know, which we had to swallow the bullet and pay everybody off and shut down the business. Uh, it cost us heavy amount of money. Of course, uh, the one that we had in Lagos was one that was set up uh, Chief Olo, which was Nigerian Texas. So a lot of the workers that started was since 1960. Uh, you know, up to that for almost about 40 years, we had to pay them the pension gratuity, which the company did not really make any reserve for. You know, so it's another big lesson that uh, you know we went through. So we decided that okay, fine, let's try the uh, manufacturing again. You know, going back in, into industry, and we look at most people. You know, like the Adepoales and oh, nobody really did well in industry. Because there is that problem of power, 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 power. You know, and without power, you can't do anything. So we decided that okay, we will still try. And uh, we look at the mistakes they made and uh, see okay, how do we need to make these things uh, change. So we went into uh, industry and the decision was to be fine. Instead of going into this industry without knowing what we are not going to use watches or whatever, no, we will just do a backward integration, meaning that what we've been trading in, we should try and produce those things that we've been trading in, you know, and that was really what helped us. So we will take up the headache of marketing, of the product, marketing distribution, for this area that we know, we know how to import them, when we have the goods, we know how to market them, we know how to distribute them. So the only area we have to fight for is to know how to produce good quality products, you know, that 
can match with any, uh, you know, anywhere. So that is what we did. We started sugar, um, you know, of salt. Uh, we had a very big uh, battle because when we started salt, it was one dominant company, you know, which was uh, Daikon. Daikon, I'm sure you must have heard Daikon salt. Daikon salt was actually the golden of uh, uh, companies in Nigeria before. They, too, they never ever brought money, they had a lot of cash. And, uh, you know, it's okay. But then, how do we convince people not to do that? Even we, when we had the, the bank, I'm sure even myself, I went to Daikon maybe minimum seven, eight times to just try and have their accounts and, uh, you know, it took us almost three years before they agreed to open an account, you know, for us. So it was a big company. But we went in there and uh, within two years we took over the entire market of uh, salt. And I think it was that time that people thought, I don't know, you know, dealing with us, you know, somebody has to be ready. You, uh, can be tough for sometimes, you know, to say, my, you know, sometimes we say we are brutal. No, nothing like that. <laughs> but, you know, it was just a marketing something because we are not really used to making that kind of money. Because when we went into the market, I remember they were selling the salt at 360 naira. And we thought, okay, well, 220 naira is good enough. And we just said, okay, we'll sell at 220. And that was really how we took the market. So we left. Uh, you know, we did uh, bags even to, you know, pack our own boots while making our own bags. I will show you later when we get that. Then uh, we move on from that time, after we put up all these things, you know, uh, by the beginning, which is the growth and the sustenance, uh, I mean growth, sustenance, and also the expansion. When we go to um, the cement, when we finish our terminal, you know, it was just a terminal which we wanted to do just about 300,000 tons per annum, most likely, maybe maximum 500,000. So we thought, okay, fine, the best thing that we'll do, there is no way in anywhere you can go and fight with Lafarge. Well, Lafarge, they are a world, uh, this, I mean, you know, they are quite big, really. You know, we didn't even want to think about that. And I uh, went to see the uh, MD. I uh, said, yes, it's possible to come to town. I went, I met with the uh, CEO of Africa when he came to Nigeria. Uh, look, why don't you come and take over this uh, factory? Give us 60%. You take 40% with man management so that you can consolidate your you know, account. Uh, we talked for almost about three months or so. to said, no, the condition is that they must take 51% majority, and also uh, management. And then we will sign an agreement that we will never do cement again, this and that. <laughs> you know, which we agreed to actually, but the only area where we had this agreement was that percentage. And uh, you know, you can see how really God works out things, you know, and I said, well, let them agree, but I refuse to agree more than the 60%, because we had almost about 13 projects at that time. And the 13 projects, you know, the banks were very small, so you had a limit of how much, you know, you could go and borrow from the banks. Uh, what actually stopped us from agreeing to the terms of Lafarge was because of uh, rumors. You know, Lagos looks big, or Nigeria looks big, but it can be small also because you know, within the cycle, we know all ourselves. And you know, at that time, some people had already started spreading the rumor that, look, you know, especially, you know, our own commissions that, look, Nambuti, they are getting very tight on cash. So if we now go and sell majority shares, it means that, yes, that story is correct. So we decided, no, not. So we said, okay, well, Lafarge should go and try that. Look, we will also come to the market and try, you know, our no, I mean, there's really nothing to fear, you know, because we've reached the end of the world. And we must try our best and see what we can try and, uh, you know, you know, and that's really how we, the uh, business started. I think uh, by the third year, in terms of market share, we've already 
take in much, much uh, higher than, uh, you know, the budget. And then we went to uh, Benue. There was a bit between ourselves and the Fudge. Even that one did not really deter us at all. You know, we were not scared of their size. You know, because sometimes when you are small, you can be more efficient. You know, and really don't get scared of anything at all. Because in life, all what you have to look at, you'll be fine. That guy you are saying that he has done well, he's a human being like you. So why can't you also do it? You know, I mean, that's what it is. So we say, okay, what? The people like running the fight, the fight is not a remote machine or whatever, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not something, they have done something and we too, we can do it. It doesn't mean that the blacks won't be open. So we saw it. We went there, there was an open bid which was recorded actually, and we ended up uh, winning January uh, cement. But what we didn't know is actually the power of Lafarge to cause a lot of mischief at that time. You know, because what they did was just to create problems with the local community and uh, the thing became very, very political. Uh, I think I went to the National Assembly uh, almost about eight or nine times about the fight in uh, Benue who uh, declared that uh, the even trucks are not allowed to go to Benue uh, state. So we had to stop all our business in Benin State because it was a big fight. And then the uh, uh, we fought, to cut the story short, we fought between ourselves, the Benin State government, for 46 months. For 46 months we fought with them and we had to actually, we had to abandon Benin to go and start building Obagena. It was when they saw Obagena was 5 million tons. You know, then they gave up. But by the time that they gave up, in annoyance, they had already burnt, there are two lines in Benin, they had already burnt down one line. You know, totally, you know, while he just the main kiln that was, you know, gone. But they, you know, they did that. But we resolved the issue. Today it is a different story. But, you know, that's also a very long part. And then uh, we had, uh, you know, they, we keep on expanding the have to uh, Management. Now what I keep saying, well, not, it's, even, it's even now that we are a bit generous in terms of giving dividends, but when we were private, um, we were not uh, giving any dividends any, well, at all. We don't give uh, dividends at all. We always invest our cash into the business, like uh, the only year which we gave a uh, dividend on Dogwood Industries, which is not a listed company, a parent company. And uh, we gave a uh, dividend of uh, two, uh, 280 million dollars, but that's 2009 dividend. So we still have not done the dividend of 2010, 2011. You know. So uh, we are always invested. Since when we started, we are not stop. So we kept on just going on. We put the business process and the structure to align with the business. Uh, vision of the group. Uh, what we keep doing uh, at that time was actually to keep calling and have just a very short uh, strategy session with maybe uh, sometimes KPMG, sometimes McKenzie. But I remember that time McKenzie did a short, uh, you know, uh, strategic uh, work for the company for five years. And uh, I think we use it only for two years because we have already exceeded that uh, uh, target. You know, so we kept it by the side. We didn't really use it. And then the expansion, you know, continued in 2003, 2000, which we had a significant, uh, uh, you know, turnover at that time. You know, 1.6 at that time was uh, quite, uh, you know, a lot. But now we are nearly almost. Uh, $4 billion.